This video is a continuation of section 4.1. Uh, we have a few more important theorems to talk about, as well as um, some more work we can do with uh, solving uh, to find least residues with exponents. All right, so let's pick up with theorem 4.5. Um, in your book, this is page 220, if you're referring to that. Okay, page 220. Uh, so this theorem states that if a is congruent to b mod m, then a to the power of n is congruent to b to the power of n mod m for all natural numbers n. All right, and we put that there. Okay, so all natural numbers are positive integers. All right, so we've talked about this before, but we haven't actually proved it. Um, but if you do know that two numbers are congruent, with a certain mod, uh, then the powers of those numbers will also be congruent as long as we're taking positive powers. All right, so um, because this is a proof that involves the natural numbers, it's a good choice for induction. So let's see how this would work out. All right, so the first step would be the base step. And we want to consider if this is true when n equals 1. All right, so we're allowed to assume a is congruent to b mod m. That's part of the hypothesis. All right, and then we're just testing if a to the first is congruent to b to the first mod m. And of course, that's the same thing as a is congruent to b. So there's really no work to even be done to show that the base case is true. All right, so then the um, inductive hypothesis step. Now we're going to assume that a to the k is congruent to b to the k mod m for some uh, natural number k. And then we need to show that this is tr uh, a true statement for k plus 1. So show to the, that a to the k plus 1 is congruent to b to the k plus 1. Okay, well if we start with the first congruence, a to the k is congruent to b to the k, right, then we have a theorem um, 4.4, or there's a corollary, uh, oh no, we do need the, uh, the theorem in this case, all right, so by theorem 4.4, um, we can multiply this congruence uh, by the other one that we're allowed to assume, which is that a is congruent to b, all right, so we're multiplying those two together, and that would just give a times a to the k is congruent to b times b to the k mod m. All right, and then simplifying, a times a to the k is a to the k plus 1. And on the right side, we have b to the k plus 1, and that's what we were trying to prove. All right, so therefore, uh, the statement is true for all n. a to the n is congruent to b to the n. Uh, mod m for all n. All right, um, the next few examples are also taken from your textbook, section 4.1, and we want to take a look at finding the least residue of uh, numbers raised to fairly large exponents. All right, so let's start out with 16 to the 53rd power. Uh, let me make that a little bit clearer. All right, and we want to find the remainder when 16 to the 53rd power is divided by 7. Okay, so uh, first of all, notice the connection between finding a remainder when divided by 7 and the modular congruences that we've talked about so far. So another way to say this would be um, what we're what we're trying to do is find 16 to the 53rd, and we want to see what that's congruent to mod 7. Okay, And what we're looking for is, is some number r uh, that's greater than or equal to 0 and less than 7. Okay, And that number is going to be the remainder when 16 to the 53rd is divided by 7. All right, so all we really need to do is just reduce 16 to the 53rd using these congruence rules until we get to the least residue. All right, so here are a couple steps. Um, the first thing we want to try to do is uh, reduce this base number 16 and make that as small as possible. 
All right, so off to the side somewhere, um, we just want to see what 16 is congruent to mod 7. Okay, and you can think about that, and we want to choose um, the number that is smaller than 7, right? And it turns out 16 is congruent to 2 mod 7. So we have a theorem that would then say that 16 to the 53rd would be congruent to 2 to the 53rd mod 7, okay? And that's the one we just proved, the one that says that you can uh, raise those, those base numbers 16 and 2 to any positive integer exponent that we want. All right, so we can at least reduce 16 to the 53rd to 2 to the 53rd. Okay, so that's still a fairly large number. So one thing you could do, of course, would be to use a, a computer to figure that out. Okay, so you could use Wolfram Alpha. Um, Excel will work, but it's good to know how to do this um, by hand for a couple reasons. Um, one is that you're uh, learning the, the theory behind this um, so that you could do this in other cases maybe where we don't have the ability to, to put this into a computer. So maybe there would be um, some exponents uh, some variables involved, um, something that we wouldn't be able to calculate. All right, so the next step is to um, try to find a suitable power of 2 mod 7. Okay, and that's some language that you can see in your textbook. Uh, so what do we mean by a suitable power of 2? Well, we just want to try to find, if I could find something like 2 to, to some exponent, that would be some number that's smaller than seven. And if, if it happened that I could raise that to some other power, right, so that that would be the same thing as two to the 53rd, then I could take this two to the X and replace it with the smaller number. All right, so I think this will be uh, more clear with, an, with actually just doing this. All right, so uh, what you wanna do is start looking at powers of two and see what they are mod seven. Okay, so 2 to the 1st um, is just congruent to 2 mod 7. And it is a fairly small number, but it doesn't really help with simplifying this. Because if I, if I look at 2 to the 1st, well, I would have to raise that to the 53rd power to equal to the 53rd. And that really doesn't help me simplify or make any sort of substitution. Oops. Okay, so next, uh, look at 2 squared and that's congruent to 4 mod 7. All right, so that's a pretty small number, so that might be a possibility, but let's keep going and see if we can find anything smaller. All right, so 2 cubed is 8, and 8 can be reduced mod 7, so that would be congruent to 1 mod 7. And generally, if you can find one of these powers of, of 2 that will reduce to like a 0 or a 1 or a negative 1, Right, those are nice convenient numbers to use. All right, so that's probably sufficient. Um, and then if you could, of course, keep going, like two to the fourth is 16, and that reduces to two mod seven. All right, so you could work with that one. That's at least helpful um, in reducing a, you know, a power of two to just a single number two. But in this case, I think let's go with the one that actually is congruent to one. All right, so now we're gonna take two to the 53rd and try to rewrite this, right, as uh, based on 2 to the third, right? So first of all, notice that um, 53 is equal to, uh, let's see, that's equal to 3 times 17 plus 2, all right? So we want to try to write, in other words, we want to try to write 53 um, as something that's got that number 3 in it, that exponent that we just used. All right, so what's the advantage of doing this? Well, now we can use exponent rules. So this is two to the three times 17 plus two. Right? And that's the same as two to the third to the 17th okay, times two squared. All right, so let's pause there and just quickly review exponent rules. All right, when you uh, have two bases that are being multiplied, the rule is that you add the exponents. Right, so we've taken this plus 2, and now we have, you know, three to the, the powers 3 times 17, 
Okay, and then here's the plus 2. And then the other rule is that when you have a power to a power, you multiply the powers. So 3 to the 17th, right, 2 to the 3rd to the 17th is the same as 2 to the 3 times 17. All right. Um, now, why did we do that? Well, now we can actually make a substitution, right? We know that 2 to the 3rd is congruent to 1 mod 7, so I can replace 2 to the 3rd with 1. So now I have 1 to the 17th times 2 squared, right? And this is all still mod 7. All right, and then that's just going to be 1 times 2 squared, which is 4, and that's already smaller than 7, so that is the least residue. All right, so then that means that the remainder when 16 to the 53rd is divided by 7 is 4. Okay, and you can check that. Um, just use a calculator or, or Wolfram Alpha would work. Okay, let's try another one. Find the remainder when 3 to the 247th power is divided by 17. Okay, so step one would be to look at the base and try to reduce that mod 17. All right, well, 3 is already the least residue, mod 17. All right, so we can skip that step and then just jump straight into looking at suitable powers of 3. Okay, so 3 to the first. Um, you can pretty much just always skip Three to you know the, the first power because that's not going to be helpful. So let's jump in with three squared, right? And that's equal to nine, and that's smaller than seventeen, so that's the least residue, right? And that's still a pretty big number, so uh, I don't know that that's going to be very helpful. So let's keep going. Okay, three to the third is congruent to well that's twenty seven, so that's congruent to ten mod seventeen. Okay, so we could possibly work with that. Um, powers of 10 are kind of nice. We know what happens with those. Uh, but let's keep going, see if we can find anything better. So 3 to the 4th is congruent to 13 mod 17. And you can check these for yourself. Um, 3 to the 5th is congruent to 5 mod 17. Okay, 3 to the 6th is congruent to 15 mod 17. Now as soon as you get to a number that's that's kind of big like that, like we're approaching 17, another thing you can do is um, subtract 17. So we could also say that 3 to the 6th is congruent to negative 2 mod 17. All right? So that's kind of a nice number because um, we know what happens with negatives when we raise them to powers. It would just depend on if the power is even or odd as to whether that would be a negative or positive. Right, and then 2 to a power is, is smaller at least than 3, right? so that might be a possibility. Um, let's keep going though. So 3 to the 7th is congruent to 11 mod 17. Okay, and 3 to the 8th is congruent to 16 mod 17. And again, notice here if you subtract 17 from that, that would give negative 1. Right, so as soon as you find one that's a 0, a 1, or a negative 1, those are going to be the most convenient. If you can't find that, then I would go with something that's at least a little bit smaller like this negative 2. All right, and then how far do you keep going? Well, um, think about the least residues mod 17. We know that the only options are going to be uh, 0 through 16. Right, and then, of course, you know we might want negatives as well. Um, so you could keep going, and eventually you might find one that actually did equal a 0 or a 1. Um, but, you know, if we've already found one that works, then that's good enough. Okay, so we'll go with 3 to the 8th. And we're going to use negative 1 instead of 16. Okay. So then next you want to rewrite this exponent 247 as uh, that exponent that we decided to use as 8 times something plus some remainder. Okay? And it, it might work out evenly, but it might not. So if you do that, you'll find that this is 8 times 30 plus 7. Okay. 
So that's what we have. And then that's going to be equal to 3 to the 8th to the 30th times 3 to the 7th. And that's just using exponent rules. All right, so that's our number. And then we want to uh, reduce this mod 17. So this is going to be congruent to, well, now I can substitute 3 to the 8th with negative 1. I make this negative 1 to the 30th times 3 to the 7th, and that's mod 17. Okay, so that's going to be uh, negative 1 to the, to the 30th. That's an even power, so that's going to make that a positive 1. And then 3 to the 7th, if you don't feel like figuring that out, um, you could just break that down into smaller powers as well. All right, so one thing you could do would be to make this, uh, let's see, 3 to the 6th was a convenient one. So again, this, this is up to you, but here's an option. So we could make this 3 to the 6th times 3. Right? And then 3 to the 6th mod 17, that was the one that was congruent to 15 mod 17, all right? Or you could subtract 17 and see that that's congruent to negative two. So let's replace that with a negative two and then we'll just leave the three alone. All right, so if you multiply all of that, that's gonna be a negative six. And then we are looking for the least residue or the remainder. So we're looking for something in the range from zero to 16. Okay, so this is a little bit too small. So let's just, at the end, we'll add 17 to get that into the right range. So that's going to be 11. All right, and then that's it. That's the remainder uh, when 3 to the 247th power is divided by 17. The remainder is going to be 11. Um, another result from this section was uh, this idea of cancellation with congruences. All right, so we know for equations it works out. If we have AC equals BC, and as long as c is not 0, we can cancel c on both sides of the equation and get a equals b. All right, does this work for congruences? Uh, and we did test some examples already, and we saw that when ac is congruent to bc mod m, um, sometimes it works. So sometimes you can cancel out c, and you'll get a true congruence, but sometimes it does not. All right, so we have a theorem in the book that, that talks about a guarantee for when we definitely can uh, cancel the C. All right, so here it is. This is theorem 4, 6. And if we have this congruence, AC is congruent to BC mod M. And we know that C and the mod M, uh, if we know that their greatest common factor is 1, right, or that they're relatively prime, then we can always cancel out C um, to get A is congruent to B. Okay, so here's the proof of this. Okay, so let's start with our two assumptions. We can use this congruence, and we can use the fact that C and M are relatively prime. Okay, um, so first of all, let's use the definition of congruence that allows us to uh, convert to a divisibility statement. So what we're saying is that we know M divides AC minus BC. All right, and then I can factor out a C, and I would know that M divides c times a minus b, okay? And then uh, we have a corollary, it's uh, corollary 3.4. And this states that if we have something like m that's dividing the product of two things, and if it happens to be relatively prime to one of those two things, which in our case we know, we know that m and c are relatively prime, right, then m must divide the other thing, it must divide a minus b. Okay, so by corollary 3.4, um, since c and m are relatively prime, that implies that m divides a minus b. All right, and then just translating that back to a congruence statement, if m divides a minus b, that means that a is congruent to b mod m. All right. Uh, so one note about this, this is giving a condition um, under which we are guaranteed to be able to cancel, but it's not saying that that's the only condition. So we will see some cases where it does work out that you can cancel C, um, even though C and M are not relatively prime, but
but we just have no guarantee that that's always the case unless they are relatively prime. So let's look at an example. Uh, we know that 24 is congruent to 12 mod 2. All right, 2 divides 24 minus 12, or we're saying these both have a remainder of 0 when they're divided by 2. Okay, so does it work to cancel, um, for instance, a 2 on both sides? Okay, so if we're thinking of the, the C as 2, can we divide each side by 2? Right, or in other words, is 12 congruent to 6 mod 2? And yes, it does work out that way. Okay, but notice it's not um, guaranteed by the theorem that we just talked about um, because the, the C, 2, and the M, 2, are not relatively prime. Their GCD is, is not equal to 1, it's equal to 2. Right, so uh, let's look at the number 4. Can we divide each side by 4? So then we would have 6 is congruent to 3 mod 2, and that's not a true statement. Okay, so again, uh, the, the C4 and the M2, their GCD was not 1, so there was no guarantee that that was going to work. Um, and then the last thing we could check, can we divide by 3? All right, well, without even dividing, I can see that the GCD of 3 and the mod 2 is 1. So by that theorem, it's guaranteed to work out. We can definitely divide by 3. And then let's just double check. So the, that would give us 8 is congruent to 4 mod 2, and that is a true statement. All right, so in the first case, it did work out. It just wasn't guaranteed by the theorem. The second case, it did not work out, right? And there should have been no expectation on our part that it would because the GCD was not equal to 1. And then in the third case, uh, we were guaranteed by that theorem that we should be able to divide by 3. Okay, here's another example. Um, 78 is congruent to 48 mod 5. And you'll notice that uh, 78 is 6 times 13, and 48 is 6 times 8. Okay, so we could think of 6 as C, and since the GCD of 6 and the mod 5 is 1, then the theorem uh, 4.6 guarantees that we can divide each side by 6, and that would mean that 13 definitely is congruent to 8 mod 5. All right, so of course in this case you don't need the theorem to be able to, to check this and see that it's true. Um, the theorem is usually more useful in cases where uh, it's not easy to check the resulting congruence to see if it's true, but we would still want to know if that's a, a possible operation we can make. Uh, one example would be when we get to solving congruences where maybe this 13 or the 8 is the variable x, then at this point we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be able to check if x is congruent to 8 uh, it depends on what x is. All right, so in that case, it would be nice to have a theorem that, that said that it was okay to divide by 6. Um, there is another theorem that, that gives another cancellation rule. So if we have AC congruent to BC mod M, and the GCD of C and M isn't necessarily 1, but it's just equal to some number D, um, then we can cancel C, we just have to change the mod and A and B would be congruent mod M divided by D. All right, so we would divide each side of the congruence by C, and we would divide M by D, and that will work out to be a true congruence. Okay, so let's look at a proof for this. Um, if we start with the congruent statement and change that over to a divisibility statement, we would know that M divides AC minus BC Okay, and that would mean that AC minus BC is equal to KM for some integer K. And that's just the definition of divisibility. When M divides this, we're saying that AC minus BC is a multiple of M. Okay, and then I can factor out a C and see that that means C times A minus B equals KM. All right, and then dividing both sides by D, we would get C over D 
on the left, and on the right, dividing by d, uh, we get m over d. All right, so now we have the equation c over d times a over b is equal to k times m over d. Okay, so going back to divisibility, this is saying that this thing on the left is a multiple of md. So I can write that m over d divides c over d times a minus b. All right. Um, now we also have a theorem uh, 3.4. Right. And this tells us, okay, since since the GCD of C and M is D, right, if I divide C and M by D, their GCD is just going to be 1, okay? And I, I would suggest if you don't remember that, uh, that you look up this theorem, right? But this is the one that's saying that the GCD of C over D and M over D is equal to 1, right? So again, um, by the same corollary that we used before, if we have MD dividing a product of two things and it's relatively prime to one of those two things, then that must mean that it divides the other one. So from this, I can get to the point where I have M over D divides A minus B. And then just converting back to a congruent statement, this means that A is congruent to B mod M over D. All right, so let's look at an example. Um, you can check this for yourself, but it is true that 8 times 37 is congruent to 8 times 7 mod 12. And we want to look at the GCD of 8 and the mod 12. Okay, so the, the number on both sides of the congruence and the modulus. All right, so the GCD of 8 and 12 is 4. And since it's not 1, I can't just divide both of these by 8, but based on the theorem that uh, that we just looked at, I can divide by 8 as long as I change the modulus. So 37 would be congruent to 7. And then for what mod? Well, you take the mod 12 and you divide it by the GCD, which is 4. All right, so it is a true statement that 37 is congruent to 7 mod 3. And again, why is this useful? Because it's, it's still not telling me anything about mod 12. Uh, well, where, where we're headed is solving congruences where maybe the 37 or the 7 would be an x, and then this is uh, going to help us solve um, for what x is. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about from this section was just to give a couple hints um, for homework. So one of the problems uh, that I'm going to have you do is number 23, and this one is asking if it's a true or false statement that 9 to the 100th power minus 1 um, is divisible by 10. Divisible by 10. Okay, so with all of these divisible statements, you want to just convert these over to uh, modular congruent statements. All right, so what it means for something to be divisible by 10, okay, if 10 is dividing 9 to the 100th minus 1, I can write that as a congruence in, in one of two different ways. So if I'm thinking of this as m divided, uh, divides a minus b, then I can rewrite this as a is congruent to b mod m. So if you already have a subtraction sign there, then it's um, pretty easy to go from this. Uh, 10 divides 9 to the 100th minus 1. Well, that would mean that 9 to the 100th is congruent to 1 mod 10. Okay. Now if you don't naturally have a subtraction sign or if you want maybe just a different way to think about this, um, you could always put in a zero here. So 10 would divide 9 to the 100th minus 1 minus 0. And then you can kind of think of the 9 to the 100th minus 1 as the a and the 0 as the b. So it would also be correct to write 9 to the 100th minus 1 is congruent to 0 mod 10. Okay. Um, another way you could get to that would be by looking at the remainders. So what it means for something to be divisible by 10, uh, and that's what we want to check, we want to see if that has a remainder of 0 
when it's divided by 10. And again, with congruences, we just we write um, that two things are congruent if they have the same remainder when divided by the modulus or by 10. All right, so that, this is what we're checking. And we don't know if this is true or not, but we want to see if 9 to the 100th minus 0, if we reduce it to the least residue, would it be 0? Would it have a remainder of 0? Okay, well, how would you check this? Um, you can do two things depending on what you're, which form you're working with. Okay, if you're trying to see if 9 to the 100th is congruent to 1 mod 10, right, then you start with just 9 to the 100th, and then you just keep reducing it until you get to the least residue mod 10. And then you just check to see if that number happens to be a 1. And how do you do that? Well, this is the, the example that we, we did a few of these. Um, you start by reducing 9, the base, to the least residue mod 10, and it already is. And then you just use exponent rules to try to, you know, uh, check 9 squared, 9 cubed, 9 to the 4th, and see if you can find anything smaller so that you can rewrite 9 to the 100th. Um, if you chose to do 9 to the 100th minus 1, and you're checking to see if that's congruent to 0, then you would just do the same thing. All right, you're going to start with 9 to the 100th minus 1 and see what that's congruent to, and just keep reducing it to the least residue, and hopefully eventually you get to the number 0. Okay, um, same idea in number 24. We're checking if 10 to the 2,001st power plus 1 is divisible by 11. So two things. You could see if 10 to the 2,001st power plus 1 is congruent to 0 mod 11. Is that a true statement? right? Or uh, you could also think of this as 10 to the 2,000th and 2,001 uh, and first power, and then think of this as minus a negative 1, and we want to see if 11 divides that. So you could also see if 10 to the 2,000 and first power is congruent to negative 1 mod 11. Okay. And you'll notice you can kind of go back and forth between these two congruent statements just by, uh, in the first case, subtracting 1 from both sides which we know is okay to do, or in the second one, you could add one to both sides and then you would get the other congruent statement. So you can choose either one. And again, you're just kind of reducing each expression mod 11 using the rules we talked about. In the first case, you're seeing if you get down to a zero, and in the second case, you're seeing if you get to a negative one. Okay, so that's the end of section 4.1, and I see that this is already a, a fairly long video, so I think um, we won't go into section 4.2, uh, but we'll pick up there next week. Um, so try the homework problems that I'll post, and then also to UZ Campus, um, if you have any questions about the previously assigned homework, um, we can talk about it online as well.